years about this to make sure that everybody in the care sector uh, receives a similar a a act of generosity from Welsh Government. We have now come to an end. I am going to give a minute suspension to allow those who do not need to be in the chamber to make way for those that need to come on. Right, let us begin. Question one, Rachel Muscle. Thank you. Number one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tomorrow I, I will open the Global Vaccine Summit. The UK-hosted virtual event will bring together more than 50 countries as well as leaders of private sector organisations and civil society to raise at least $7.4 billion for Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. And tomorrow's Global Vaccine Summit should be the moment when the world comes together to unite humanity in the fight against disease. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Rachel Musk. As the Prime Minister of his gates over his adviser, the real scandal of the coronavirus pandemic has been exposed in the Public Health England report published yesterday, Inequality and Poverty. If you are black or Asian, if you are poor, if you have a low-skilled job, the mortality risk is up to double that of the rest of the population, the poorest having the greatest exposure, risk and fate. And now the government is seriously increasing that exposure and risk with its easement announcements. Why won't the Prime Minister publish a full health and economic risk assessment for public scrutiny to protect us all from this deadly virus? Prime Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. And this Government commissioned uh, the review from Public Health England, and we take its findings very seriously because there obviously are uh, inequalities in the way that the virus impacts on uh, different people, different uh, communities uh, in our country. And uh, my uh, right honourable friend, the Minister for, uh, for Equalities, uh, the member for Saffron Waldron, uh, will be looking at what next, next practical steps we need to do to protect all our country from coronavirus. Scott Benson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over the past few weeks, Blackpool has been inundated with visitors and the images of people not social distancing and leaving our beach strewn with litter have angered my constituents at a time when they are doing the right thing and following the government's advice. The fact that Blackpool has one of the highest local infection rates in the nation has only served to heighten these fears. What assistance is the government providing to areas such as Blackpool to deal with the influx of visitors at a time when local services are already under pressure? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, 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 he well represents uh, Blackpool, his constituents, sticking up for the interests of Blackpool, in addition to the, the £3.2 billion we're already given to local councils to help combat uh, corona. Uh, Blackpool w w is receiving another £9 million uh, in particular, uh, as well as the funding uh, from the High Street Fund and the Town Fund to deal with the particular problems uh, that he rightly identifies. Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by expressing shock and anger at the death of George Floyd? This has shone a light on racism and hatred experienced by many in the US and beyond. I'm surprised the Prime Minister hasn't said anything about this yet, but I do hope that next time he speaks to President Trump, he will convey to him the UK's abhorrence about his response to the events. Yeah. Mr Speaker, The Telegraph this morning is reporting that the Prime Minister has decided to take direct control of the government's response to the virus. So an obvious question for the Prime Minister, who has been in direct control up till now? Mr. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, let me, let me begin by associating myself uh, absolutely with what uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman had to say about the death of George Floyd. And uh, I think what happened uh, in, uh, in the United States was appalling, it was inexcusable, we all saw it uh, on our screens, and I, I perfectly understand uh, people's right to protest uh, what took place, though obviously I also believe that protests should take place in a, a lawful and reasonable way. On his uh, 
more polemical point, uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, this government is, uh, I take full responsibility for everything this government has been doing uh, in tackling coronavirus, and I'm very proud of, uh, of our record. And if you look at what we have achieved uh, so far, it is very considerable. We have, uh, we have protected the NHS. Uh, we, have, we have driven down uh, the death rate. Uh, we, we are now seeing far fewer hospital admissions. And uh, I, believe, I believe that the public understand that with good British common sense, uh, we will continue to defeat this virus and take this country forward. And what I think the country would like to hear from him is uh, more signs of cooperation in that endeavour. Yes. Mr Speaker, um, he asked for a sign of cooperation, a fair challenge. I wrote to him, as he knows, in confidence two weeks ago to ask if I could help build the consensus for getting children back into our schools. I did it confidentially and privately because I didn't want to make a lot of it. He hasn't replied. Yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, this is a critical week in our response to COVID-19. Whereas lockdown and stay at home were relatively easy messages, easing restrictions involves very difficult judgment calls. So this is the week of all weeks where public trust and confidence in the government needed to be at its highest. But as the director of the Reuters Institute, which commissioned a YouGov poll this weekend said, I have never in 10 years of research seen a drop in trust like we've seen for the UK government. How worried is the Prime Minister about this loss of trust? Prime Minister, I, I'm surprised you should take that tone, Mr. Speaker. Since I, I, took, the, I took the trouble, uh, I took the trouble to ring him up, and uh, we had a long conversation in which I briefed uh, the right honourable gentleman about all the steps uh, that we were taking. He didn't offer any uh, any dissent uh, at that stage. I may say, Mr. Speaker, he thoroughly endorsed uh, our approach, and I, I believe that he should continue uh, to endorse it today. I think I think that uh, he's on on better ground and firmer ground uh, when he stands with the overall overwhelming majority of the British people who, who understand the very, very difficult circumstances that we are in uh, and who want clarity from across the political spectrum, uh, but who believe that we can move forward, provided we continue to observe the basic rules on social distancing, on washing our hands, and on making sure that when we have symptoms, when we have symptoms, we take a test and we isolate. And I think everybody understands that. That's why the, uh, the, disease, the instance of this disease is coming down. And I think his attempts uh, to distract the public from that have not been successful, because they continue to pay attention to our guidance. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister challenges me on the offer I made to him. This was a confidential letter. I think the best thing I can do is put it in the public domain, and the public can decide for themselves uh, how constructive we're being. Um, Mr. Mr Speaker, um, two weeks ago today at the dispatch box, the Prime Minister promised that we will have a test, track and trace operation that will be world-beating, and yes, it will be in place by the 1st of June, but it isn't. And a critical element, a critical element, the ability of local authorities to respond to local spikes is missing. As one council leader put it to us, we're weeks away from having this fully up and running. We simply weren't given enough warning. The Prime Minister mutters it's not true. Dido Harling, Harding, the Prime Minister's own chair of the truck and trace system, has said that this element will not be ready until the end of June. The Prime Minister must have been briefed on this problem before he made that promise two weeks ago. So why did he make that promise? Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid I think I'm afraid he's uh, casting aspersions on the efforts of, of tens of thousands of people who have set up a test, track, and trace system in this country from a standing start. We now have 40,000 people engaged in this. Every person, uh, thousands of people, are being tested, as, as he knows, every every day. Every person uh, who tests positive in this country in the track and trace system uh, is contacted, then thousands of their contacts are themselves uh, contacted, people they've been in contact with, and I can, t I can tell the House, at the moment, as a result of our test, track and trace system, which was up and running 
on the 1st of June, as I said, Mr Speaker, contrary to what he said, which was up and running, as a result of, of their efforts, thousands of people are now following our guidance, following the law and self-isolating to stop the spread of the disease. Mr Starmer. Mr Speaker, I welcome that news from the Prime Minister. He didn't put a number on those that have been traced. Um, but as he knows, the number of people testing positive for COVID-19 every day is only a fraction of those actually infected every day. According to the ONS, the number actually infected every day is between seven and 9,000. Assuming up to five contacts need to be traced for every infected person, the system probably needs to reach 45,000 people a day. So there's a long way to go. And I'm sure if it is 45,000 uh, a day, the Prime Minister will confirm that in just a minute. But the problem when the Prime Minister used statistics is that the Statistics Authority have had concerns on more than one occasion. Yesterday, in a strongly worded letter to the Health Secretary, the Chair of the UK Statistics Authority said that the statistics still fall well short of expectations. He went on to say, it is not surprising that given their inadequacy, data on testing are so widely criticised and so often mistrusted. Can the Prime Minister see how damaging this is to public trust and confidence in his government? I, I must say to the Honourable right, Gentleman, I, I really do not see uh, the purpose of his endless attacks on, uh, the, on, public, on public trust and confidence when what we are trying to do, and I think what the public want to hear from uh, politicians across all parties, is our clear messages about how to defeat this virus. Test and trace is a vital tool in our armoury. And contrary, contrary to what he says, actually, uh, we did, by the end of May, get up to 100,000 uh, tests a day, uh, we di and, and we got up to 200,000 by the, by the beginning beginning of this month. And that was, that was an astonishing achievement, not, not by government, but by tens of thousands of people working to support government. And I think he should pay tribute to them and what they've achieved. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is confusing scrutiny for attacks. I have supported the government openly, and I've taken criticism for it. But boy, he makes it difficult to support this government over the last two weeks. Mr Speaker, another critical issue on trust and confidence is transparency about decision making. On the 10th of May, the Prime Minister said on the question of lifting restrictions, if the alert level won't allow it, we will simply wait and go on until we've got it right. At the time when he said that, the alert level was four, and the R rate was between 0.5 and 0.9. We're now three weeks on, some restrictions have been lifted, so can the Prime Minister tell us what's the alert level now and what's the R rate now? Prime Minister, he knows perfectly well that the alert level does allow it. And, that's, and, and, and indeed, he didn't, he, didn't raise, he didn't raise that issue uh, with me when we had a conversation uh, on the telephone. And, 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 he, and he knows the reason we've been able to make the progress that we have is that the five tests have been fulfilled. So, uh, yes, the alert level remains at four, but as, as Sage will confirm, we've managed to protect the NHS. We've got the rate of deaths down. We've got the rate of infection down. Uh, the PPE crisis, the PPE difficulties in care homes, uh, the, the question of the R, they have been addressed. And I think the question for him, Mr Speaker, is whether he actually supports the progress we're making. Because at the, at the, weekend, at the weekend, he was backing it. Now he's doing a U-turn. Now, now he seems to be against the, the steps that this country is taking. I have supported the Government in the gradual easing of restrictions. That is why I wrote to the Prime Minister two weeks ago, because I could see the problem with, I, I could see the problem with schools, and I thought it needed leadership and consensus, and I privately offered to do what I could to build that consensus. That is the offer that wasn't taken up. Mr Speaker, can I finally, finally turn to the question of Parliament? Mr Speaker, I know you feel very strongly about this. The scenes yesterday of MPs queuing to vote and members being unable to vote were frankly shameful. This should not be a political issue. Members on all sides know that this is completely unnecessary and unacceptable. If any other employer behaved like this, it would be a clear and obvious case of indirect discrimination under the Equalities Act. A clear and obvious case. So can I urge the Prime Minister to stop this? and to continue to allow online voting 
and the hybrid parliament to resume. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, again, I, look, I, 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 must, I, I do think that the, the right honourable gentleman needs to consider what is really going on throughout the country, where ordinary people are, are getting used to, to queuing uh, for, for long periods of time to do their shopping uh, or, or whatever it happens to be. I must say, I do, not think it un, I do not think it unreasonable that we should ask parliamentarians to come back to this place and do their job for the people of this country. And I know it's difficult. I know it's different. I'm, I apologise. I apologise to colleagues for the inconvenience, and I, and I apologise to all those who are, and I apologise to all those who have particular difficulties with it because they are shielded or because they are elderly. And, and it's vital that they should. And, and the change we're making today is that they they should be able to vote by proxy. They should be able to vote by proxy. But I, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, when when the people of this country look at what we are doing, asking schools. He now says he supports going schools to go back. I mean, our, our, our policy is is, is test. Test, trace, and isolate. His, his policy is agree, U turn, and then criticise, uh, Mr. Speaker. But uh, what, I can tell, what I can tell him is that I do think the people of this country, uh, on the whole, will want their parliamentarians to be back at work, doing their job, passing, passing legislation on behalf of the people of this country. And that is what, that is what this government intends to do. Jeremy Hill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister on hitting the 200,000 daily capacity target for testing, which puts us at the top of the European League table for testing? The Prime Minister rightly said he wanted a 24-hour turnaround for testing. Uh, could he tell us how many of the tests are currently being turned around within 24 hours and whether he'd be willing to publish on a regular basis that number? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, well, can I congratulate my right honourable friend on the kind of detailed forensic question that uh, we could have had uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, but the, the, answer, the answer is that uh, we already do uh, 90 per cent of tests turn around within 48 hours. Of the tests conducted at the 199 testing centres, and, and as well as the mobile test centres, uh, they are all done within, within 24 hours. And uh, I, I can undertake to him now to get all tests uh, turned around uh, in 24 hours uh, by the end of June, except for difficulties with postal tests or, or insuperable problems like that. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Watching events unfold across America in recent days and the actions and rhetoric from the American President have been distressing and deeply worrying. We cannot delude ourselves at believing that we are witnessing anything short of a dangerous slide into autocracy. It is in times like these when people look to those they elect for hope, for guidance, for leadership and for action. However, in the seven days since George Floyd was murdered, the UK government has not even offered words and has not expressed that pain. It has shuttered itself in the hope that no one would notice. The Prime Minister skirted over this earlier in Prime Minister's questions. So can I ask the Prime Minister what representations has he made to his ally Donald Trump? And at the very least, Prime Minister, say it now, Black Lives Matter. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, of course Black Lives Matter, and, and I totally understand uh, the, uh, the, the anger, the grief uh, that is felt uh, not just in America but around the world and, and in our country as well. I totally understand that uh, and, I, and I get that. And I, I also support, as, as I've said, uh, the right to protest. The only point I would make to the House is that protests should be carried out uh, lawfully. And, and in this country, protests should be carried out in accordance with our rules on social distancing. In Blackford. Well, I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister didn't answer the question of what representations has he made to his friend Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, it is imperative that the UK is vocal on human rights, freedom to gather and protest, freedom of speech and upholding press freedom in other parts of the world. It would be nothing short of hypocrisy if we were to turn a blind eye to events unfolding in the US. However, actions speak louder than words. And the Prime Minister can shake his hands. Ed, but the UK exports millions of pounds worth of riot control equipment to the US, including tear gas and rubber bullets. The Prime Minister must have seen how these weapons are used on American streets. With the government's own guidance warning against equipment being used in such a way, will the Prime Minister urgently review 
such exports. Yeah. Minister, I, I, I'm happy to, to look into any complaints, but uh, uh, as he knows, all uh, exports are conducted in accordance with the consolidated guidance, and the UK is possibly the most scrupulous country in that respect uh, in, in the world. Hunt. Mr Speaker, I have a number of businesses that serve the wedding market and would like to hold viewings to make bookings for the future. Church leaders of Loughborough have also contacted me about access to churches, both for services and to help tackle loneliness. Please could I ask that religious faiths be allowed to let people into their places of worship, observing social distancing within their premises, and wedding venues to be allowed to access for bookings. Thank you. Prime Minister. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I very much understand the, the urgency that many, many people in this country feel about the need to reopen uh, places of worship. Uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Local Government, Community and Local Government, is of course leading a task force on this, this very matter. It is a tough one. Every time you do something like this, you push up the risk of infection, you push up the risk to the R again. And I cannot, you know, just to, to repeat what I was saying earlier on to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, we are not there yet. We are getting there, but we are not yet there yet. It is vital that the people of this country understand the continued need to push down on that infection rate. Lord Russell our firefighters have been assisting this COVID crisis. They've taken 12 additional areas of work supporting our NHS. And while they are busier than ever, they are about to face another round of devastating cuts. My local fire authority in East Sussex is planning to remove 10 fire trucks from the county and the loss of frontline firefighters. Is the Prime Minister planning to respond to the FBU the Fire Brigade Union letter sent to him on the 22nd of May calling for a moratorium on cuts? Clapping on Thursdays is well and good, but will he put his money where his mouth is and ensure that no fire authority needs to cut frontline firefighters when they have been helping save our country? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I will certainly respond to his letter. All hold. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Prime Minister agree that as we exit the pandemic, it's critical that we not only stimulate the UK economy, but also we start the important process of levelling up? This should include stimulating the housing market to help excellent companies like PWS at Newton Aycliffe, investing in rural broadband to help villages like Killaby, and maybe moving the Treasury to Sedgefield. The acceleration of rolling stock investment to help companies like Hitachi. Can I also ask him to jo join me in, in opening the station at Furry Hill that I'm sure he's going to ask the Transport Secretary to approve? Minister. <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, a brilliant idea there. Uh, I, 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 I think Sedgefield should be careful what it wishes for. Uh, but uh, I, 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 will, I, will, I will certainly investigate that possibility. Um, but you know, when you when you look at what we're we're doing, uh, my honourable friend will know whether whether it's. Uh, 300,000 homes that we want to build every year, massive investment in, in gigabit broadband, uh, huge investment in, uh, in, in railways and roads. Uh, I, I will make sure uh, that I add to that a, a, an ambition uh, to come and see Ferry Hill uh, Station uh, launched with him. <laughs> well, the Prime Minister um, address himself to the question of quarantine arrangements. Most European countries have had quarantine arrangements for quite a while now and are beginning to reduce them. This country has had no quarantine arrangements uh, to date and is only now introducing them. Why is that? Prime Minister. Uh, for the simple reason that as we get the uh, rate of infection down with the, with the efforts that we are making as a, as a country, it is vital uh, that we, we avoid reinfection from elsewhere and, and that's why uh, we're doing it. Mr. Speaker, when my right honourable friend attended the uh, liaison committee last week, he very kindly committed to me to speak to the Chancellor about the possibility of including self employment income received by way of dividend in the calculation of furlough support. And I wonder whether my right honourable friend had had the opportunity to have that conversation, whether he had some good news for the House, because there are hundreds and thousands of self employed people up and down this country who need that support. Yeah. Minister. Uh, I'm grateful to, to my right honourable friend. He raises a very, very uh, important point, and I have an answer of fantastic complexity uh, here uh, before me. But the, the gist of it is that uh, at present HMRC would be forced to rely 
on all sorts of information uh, that they would not be able themselves uh, to verify very easily in order to comply uh, with his wishes. But I'm happy to discuss it uh, more fully with him uh, and to write to him in detail. Paul Blomfield. In front of the Liaison Committee last week, the Prime Minister was clearly shocked to learn that many migrants living and working lawfully in the UK have no recourse to public funds. Without support, many have been forced to continue working in unsafe conditions or have been pushed into extreme poverty. He promised the Liaison Committee that he would do all he could to help. Scrapping the policy would be the best step. So can he update the House on his progress? Uh, uh, yes, Mr Speaker. Uh, I can, what, I can, what I can tell the House is that everybody knows that uh, no recourse to public funds is a long uh, standing condition that uh, applies to people here with temp temporary immigration status. But that doesn't, it, it's a term of art. It doesn't mean that they are necessarily excluded from all public funds. And for instance, uh, they may be eligible for coronavirus job re uh, retention scheme funds, uh, self employed income support scheme funds, uh, and indeed, if they've paid in. Uh, to, uh, to, to the benefit system, they may be uh, eligible also uh, for certain benefits. Mark Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As we come out of lockdown, it is vital that we get our economy firing on all cylinders. In Bolsover, to level up, we need more skilled jobs. So will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, meet with me to discuss my proposal for Bolsover to lead the country with a green enterprise zone so that we can bring low-carbon manufacturing and research to our region? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he has exactly the right vision uh, for Bolsover, and it is indeed the vision that I have for the, for the whole country. The green recovery is going to be uh, essential uh, to this country's success in the next, in the next few years. I am happy uh, to meet with him to discuss it. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Community Secretary has admitted unlawfully overruling his own planning inspector to allow the Westbury development to go ahead, potentially saving the developer, Richard, Richard Desmond, who is a Conservative Party donor, £40 million in tax. He did this just weeks after sitting next to the developer at a Tory fundraising dinner. Given that this was the same scheme that the Prime Minister tried to push through when he was Mayor of London, that reappeared after he entered Downing Street, will he now tell the House what conversations he has had with the Secretary of State about the scheme and will he publish all relevant correspondence between Number 10 and the Department? Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm happy to tell the uh, Honourable Lady that I've had no conversations on that matter, whatever, uh, nor any exchanges of any kind. Laura Trott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The lockdown has seen a rise in antisocial behaviour in my area, including at Lullingston Castle, where a man sadly died last Thursday evening. My sincere condolences are with his family and friends at this time. This incident shows the need for more visible police in Sevenoaks. Can the Prime Minister confirm that the 147 new police officers promised to Kent will not be delayed and they will be focused on front-line policing to tackle antisocial behaviour? Prime Minister, will that be? Yes, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker, and that's why this government is going to get on with its uh, agenda of uniting and levelling up the 20,000 uh, more police officers. In fact, uh, we've, we've recruited uh, thousands already, and I'm pleased to say that uh, the 147 uh, that she identifies coming to Kent, uh, if they haven't actually already got there, I think they've already got there, but they haven't got there, they're getting there very shortly. Really Thank you, Mr Speaker. And view the Health Secretary admitting yesterday that COVID outbreaks are worse in deprived areas and that our great cities have been hardest hit. And the PM's just said he takes these inequalities very seriously earlier in the session. Can he now promise me that Liverpool City Council and Knowsley Borough Council will get the full cost of their COVID spend reimbursed, as they were told they would, instead of only half of it, which is what they've been allocated? I raised it with him on the 11th of May, and he promised he'd look into it. I have written to him. But I haven't had a reply. Uh, I'll be, um, she has raised it before. I pointed out that uh, we've given an extra £3.2 billion to local uh, government and another £600 million to help them fire the, for, fire, deal with the particular costs of uh, care homes. But I'm happy uh, to write back to her about the particular needs of Liverpool and those of the council. Bob Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Buckinghamshire Council has been able to help thousands of local businesses thanks to the £91 million grant from the business department. But despite the very best efforts of its staff, uh, 13 million uh, remains unclaimed. I and the council would like all of that money to be able to be given to small businesses that need it to survive. But at the minute, that's not allowed. 
Will my right honourable friend seek to persuade his Cabinet colleagues that this would be a win-win, more help for businesses in need, without costing the government a penny more than has already been allocated? Uh, Mr. Uh, we are certainly talking to all councils. I'm grateful to him, uh, and uh, he, he represents the, his businesses well in Aylesbury. We're, looking, we're talking to all councils about how they can properly utilise the allocations that they have. Ben Bradshaw. Uh, the Public Health Minister told me in an email on May the 22nd that the justification for a 14-day quarantine is, and I quote, where local COVID incidents and prevalence is much lower relative to international incidents and prevalence. It's not, is it? So why is he inflicting from Monday a blanket quarantine with no basis in science that will devastate our travel industry and rob British families of their foreign holidays? Mr. I'm surprised to hear that criticism from the Labour benches. I thought that the, the opposition was in favour of, uh, of, of looking at of the quarantine uh, policy, but uh, the simple reason is to protect. The answer is to protect the British people from the re-importing of that disease once we have driven infection rates down. Henry Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Aviation was one of the first sectors to take an immediate negative impact from the coronavirus uh, pandemic and will probably be one of the slowest to recover. Uh, will my right honourable friend uh, consider an extension to the uh, furlough for air industry employees through the low season and into 2021? Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to make a commitment, alas, uh, to uh, extend the, uh, the, the coronavirus job retention scheme now, but we will certainly, uh, but he represents the aviation sector, which has been very, very hard hit, and we will look at all the ways uh, we can uh, to support it uh, throughout the crisis. Flora Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope that the Prime Minister will join me in standing together not only at grief at the killing of George Floyd but also determination that we will work together against racism, both in the US and here in the UK. In Putney, black teachers have told me they're scared of going back to school because of the higher rates of death. And also today's figures from the Metropolitan Police show that more than a quarter of lockdown fines have been for black people, although they are an eighth of our London population. Will the Prime Minister condemn the actions of the American police? Will he freeze the sales of tear, gas and rubber bullets? Will he review the lockdown fines and will he act on the, on the report into Covid deaths so that more white, there aren't more black people dying than white? Sorry, we're not going to get other people in. We've got to be fair to each other. Prime Minister. Okay, well, uh, um, she raises a very important series of points. Uh, I certainly condemn the killing uh, uh, of George Floyd and uh, we will certainly make sure that everything uh, that we export to any country around the world is in accordance with the uh, consolidated guidance on, on human rights. Laura Farris. This government has taken the lead on tackling domestic abuse, but there is an ugly dimension that remains unresolved. Where men who kill their partners in appalling acts of sexual violence establish in court that she asked for it and avoid a murder conviction, does my right honourable friend agree that the time is now to end the rough sex defence? Yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah. She raises, I uh, thank my honourable friend, she raises an incredibly important uh, point, and uh, we uh, do, uh, we, we are committed to ensuring that the law is made clear on, on this point, and that defence is inexcusable. Tim Farrell. Mr Speaker, the virus effectively turned summer into winter for Cumbrian tourism. Ending government funding in October, though, will mean three winters in a row, causing severe hardship on top of the already 312% increase we've had in unemployment locally. So will the Prime Minister provide a support package for tourism and hospitality in the lakes, the dales and elsewhere to see them through to the spring of 2021? Minister. I'm, I'm grateful to the Honourable right Member. We are we're certainly looking at all sorts of uh, packages to help the tourism industry, creative ideas to help the tourism industry over uh, the winter period so that uh, their winter, as it were, can uh, continue to be a kind, of, a kind of summer once we can get things open again. Uh, but uh, there are all sorts of packages that we'll be bringing forward, but I don't want to uh, extend uh, some of the schemes that we currently have. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm very proud to tell you that we have two and a half thousand world-class steelworkers in Scunthorpe. And like steelmakers across this land, they stand ready to make steel for HS2. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has said in this House that he wants to see that happen. Can he reassure me that he will press for HS2 to sign the UK Steel Charter and that steel for HS2 will be made in Britain? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we are doing everything we can to support the, uh, the UK uh, steel industry and to make sure that, as, 
HS2 goes forward that it maximises the use of UK steel. And I'm proud to say that uh, 98% of the countries, uh, of the companies that have uh, signed up to deliver uh, for HS2 are based in this country. Andy Schlotter. When the Prime Minister was forced to publish the review of the risk COVID-19 poses to black and minority ethnic groups yesterday, why did he remove reference to the thousand responses to the review, many of which cited structural racism and discrimination as root causes of higher risk? If, unlike Trump, he seeks to represent the whole country he is elected to lead, what action is he going to take to show that, in tackling COVID-19 and wider racism in society, black lives matter? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the Honourable Gentleman may have missed some of the earlier answers I've given, but uh, he's wrong uh, when he says that uh, this government was somehow forced to publish a review. This government commissioned the review because we take it incredibly seriously. It's our review. And yes, I do think it intolerable that Covid falls uh, in such a discriminatory way on on different groups and different communities in our country. And that's why uh, we are going to ensure that our Minister for Equalities takes up that report and sees what practical steps we need to take to protect those minorities. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend has rightly been focusing on keeping people safe, but that task goes beyond COVID-19. So can my right honourable friend give me the reassurance that as from the 1st of January 2021, the UK will have access to the quantity and quality of data it currently has through PRUM, Passenger Name Records, ECRIS and SIS2, none of which, I believe, should require the ECJ jurisdiction in the UK. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, that depends, I'm afraid, on uh, the outcome of our negotiations, as she, uh, as she knows well, but I'm absolutely confident uh, that our friends and partners will see sense and the great mutual benefit in continuing to collaborate in exactly the way that we do. We now come to the end. In order to allow safe exit, honourable members participating in the item of business and safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am now suspending the House for five minutes. <laughs>